cognitive dissonance. What is it? It's the holding of two conflicting beliefs or values at the same time. So when related to narcissistic abuse, it's the feeling when you're trauma bonded. It's the feeling when you think, I want to talk to the narcissist. I want to talk to that person. I want to reach out and break no contact, even though you know exactly what they are. Your beliefs and what you desire to do are in direct conflict with one another. I desire to have no contact. I, I believe I should, but then there's a, the conflict of what you actually desire, which is to break no contact. So it's like your beliefs are telling you no, and your wants are saying, but I really want to. The problem with it, well, there's a huge problem with it. If you've ever felt it, you know the problem with it. You are locked down into a behavior and emotional patterns that do not correspond with what you want for your life, right? You're locked into this feeling like a trap, feeling bonded, feeling connected, feeling a desire for something that's really bad for you, knowing that it's not what you want for your life and you can't make it stop, right? You just keep, it just keeps going. It's like um, you're stuck, right? Tied to the narcissist, those trauma bonds and the cognitive dissonance that, that holds you there um, make it hard to move forward with your life, right? The other thing that happens is we start to self-blame because we think I know better. Why am I, why do I care? I know better. And so we start to self-blame and it, it can then become about your feelings toward yourself. What creates cognitive dissonance is the cycle of the love bombing and the devalue, as well as gaslighting. It really confuses and muddles up your brain. And what it basically is, is the holding of two opposing thoughts or two opposing beliefs at the same time. So I love him even though kind of thoughts, or I can't ever trust him. He's not so bad. You know, like completely opposing thoughts or her can't ever trust her. She's not so bad. It's not just him, guys. A really confusing place to be in because our minds know better. Our minds know what's going on. We can even, we can even name the behaviors when they're happening sometimes. But then at the same time, there's this total feeling of love and dedication and connection to this person. When that happens, you can see how the the question of, are they really a narcissist? Are they really as bad as I think it they are, would come into play, okay? And then, so when you have the this going on, there's also something called abuse amnesia, and it's kind of similar, except that what it is and basically you forget the abuse that happened. And this is interesting. I'm gonna have to look at notes here. So excuse my looking down here because I have to read this. It's kind of the more technical stuff of what's actually happening inside your brain. All right. So there are some chemicals going on in your body. All right. Oxytocin. We know what oxytocin is, right? Oxytocin is the bonding chemical in your body. It is, it feels like love. Okay, it's what gives you the, the feelings of love and, and bonding. Dopamine. Dopamine makes you crave. It makes you pursue. It makes you long. It makes you hunt. It makes you want something. Okay, it makes you desire something. It, it's a drive. It's a driving chemical. It gives you the, the a feeling of a driving force in your life. It's a, it's a, we all need it, but when you can see when it's linked back to someone toxic, how this can happen. Then there's something called uh, androgynous opioids. And what happens with that is basically lack of them creates pain and use of them creates pleasure. That's, I, that's as uh, boiled down as I can get it here. And then, and then there's cortisol and adrenaline. And those are stress hormones. Okay, so what happens is you have a cortisol reaction and a stress reaction from a toxic person having being abusive to you or you're having, you're being gaslighted or whatever's happening and, and you have this stress reaction, it activates the androgynous op opioids, which then activates the dopamine, which then gives us the longing and the drive. And this is why we want to make break no contact. It gives us the longing and the drive to, because we have the pain from no contact. Um, 
it gives us that longing and the drive to resolve, to resolve whatever's going on. And as soon as there's breadcrumbs or love bombing, boom, there's the oxytocin. And suddenly this abuse amnesia happens. Why? Because it is much easier to believe what feels good than it is to believe what feels bad. It's a it's defense mechanism to protect you from further abuse, even though it's actually blocking you from seeing the thing you need to leave, okay? So what helps with that? So you can see how that all related would create that question, what if they're not a narcissist? Because even though you know what's going on, you may have forgotten a lot of the abuse and there's why, that's why what's happening. Basically the abuse becomes a system, okay? And a system wants equilibrium and the equilibrium is found, the balance is found in that cycle of love bombing and devalue. And that cycle itself then creates these, this cognitive dissonance and this abuse amnesia. So that's why we question it. That's why we question it. So what it creates when you have cognitive dissonance is it's extremely uncomfortable. You know better and you're doing it anyway. It's like a, an invisible magnet. You picture like a cartoon with the invisible magnet pulling it pulling the thing forward and they're fighting to get away from it. Like your brain and your mind and your thoughts. And sometimes even some of the patterns you're setting up are pulling you away from that thing that's toxic and some invisible force is pulling you towards that thing. And it's extremely uncomfortable. Um, so that discomfort, what happens is instead of riding with the discomfort, we start reacting to the discomfort and going with the feelings of cognitive dissonance and either, um, having the pervasive thought loops that go with it or reaching out to something toxic or self-sabotaging or doing things that aren't healthy for ourselves, avoiding it. Um, all kinds of things that aren't healthy for ourselves that don't fix the problem. They kind of just either gloss over it for a little while and then it comes back strong or it just makes it. Okay. So how does this happen in narcissistic abuse? Why is it so prevalent? Why do, what, what is it from? Okay. It's from several things. Um, the intermittent reinforcement that a narcissist gives with the love bomb and devalue side, build up of good, pulling the rug out from under you out of nowhere, you're always on eggshells because of the intermittent reinforcement. That creates this feeling uh, in your brain of confusion, right? And that confusion starts to feed into this cognitive dissonance. It's gaslighting. Gaslighting sets up confusion and it starts you to, it creates its uh, feelings and disbelief of self and it it helps to uh create more cognitive dissonance because how can you believe yourself like if you see something and you you believe something's happening your experience is then in, uh, invalidated and not only that but flipped around and turned on you so that you're told you're crazy how can you trust yourself so how do you know if what the thing that you saw and you know about this narcissist is the truth or the feeling of love you have for them is the truth. The truth is they're both the truth, but, but we got to understand that what's keeping us safe is understanding who that narcissist is and being aware that when you're being gaslighted, you're being gaslighted. And that is a manipulation tactic. And you have to understand each of these things in order to break the cognitive dissonance. Okay. Um, and then they allow and even feed into your empathy and love growing toward them. Right. So they are, reeling you in with all of the love bombing and with all of the the neediness and all of the affection and the and the false connection and all of that. So while they're doing that, and then all of a sudden, what? It flips, they devalue. And um, when that rug is pulled out from under you, when the devaluing hits, um, or the silence, or anything that they do, the gaslighting, all of the stuff that they do, it sets off a cognitive dissonance response in you. It, um, you are holding both the truth of what you wish they could be, what you know they could be, and the reality of how they act. It doesn't make sense. We get super confused. We know they could be good people. Yeah, if we implanted empathy in their brain and, and the ability to grow their emotional intelligence enough to become self-aware enough and accountable to themselves, sure, they could meet their potential. Can we do that? No, <laughs> nobody can. They can't even do it for themselves. So but the way it looks from our perspective is this person with great potential 
or all this loving and all we want to get back to the beginning. That's what people always say at the end. I wish I could just get it back to the beginning. Well, you can't. That was fake. That's how a narcissist reels you in. That's called grooming. It, that isn't the honeymoon phase that mo every healthy relationships go through the honeymoon phase, right? You go through, you meet someone, you, you get all excited, you have the, the lovey dovey time, whatever. That's kind of normal. But the narcissist does that ramped up many, many notches, right? And it's not that they're in a honeymoon phase, they're in the seductive um, luring in of new supply phase, which is just them playing with a brand new toy. That's all it is. So but we don't see it that way, right? We see it as the greatest, most exciting thing that's ever happened off the often. And we want to get back there. But the cognitive dissonance that keeps making us want to get back there is what's keeping us stuck in the trauma bond. So we've got to break it. What it boils down to is it doesn't matter what they're called. If they're toxic, they're toxic. If your life is miserable because of another person and it can't be resolved through uh, the means of normal and healthy communication, then over, right? There's no point. With, the, with abuse amnesia, forgetting feels good. It feels better to forget. And it's a defense mechanism to help you cope with the situation that you're in. So what would override that? To me, what makes sense is logic. Logic overrides it. You make a list of the abuses and you can't deny them. To realize that what you're feeling is okay when, it, when it's negative even though it doesn't feel like the good feeling, right? So realize that feeling anger and, you know, all of the things we feel, sadness and grief and all of that, they're, they're things we need to feel in order to see the truth. A lot of times when we ask that question, is, are they really a narcissist? Or let's just even say, are they really toxic, right? We don't, we can't diagnose them. So, but we can look at the pattern of the way they treat us and realize is that a toxic pattern so in order to see that it is a toxic pattern and stop hiding the truth from ourselves, we need to feel what we feel about the actual abuse that happens and and realize that when we're not feeling it we're probably in a state of cognitive dissonance or abuse amnesia does that make sense so ways to get yourself back into the reality of the fact that this is a toxic relationship or is it not? I mean, it's, not, it's everybody has to determine for them, themselves the relationship that they're living in, whether or not that suits their life and whether or not it's healthy for their life. We can't diagnose anybody else. So making lists of the things you find abusive is number one. That is so useful for so many things. It's useful in helping to break trauma bonds and it's useful in remembering, remembering, you know, and write it down as soon as you can so that you do remember it. And remembering that your logic needs to be listened to here. You have to listen to the part of yourself that says, oh, that actually did happen. Okay. Even if you're not feeling it, this is the thing with cognitive dissonance. Your logic is telling you something. Your mind is telling you this happened. This, is, this isn't right. It doesn't feel as bad as it should feel sometimes. Does that make sense? Like it doesn't feel as bad. If you heard it happened to someone else, you'd be enraged. But when you feel the feeling of it from having it happen to you, am I saying that right? Then it's sort of a numb feeling or it, it can even be like uh, candy coated, you know, so that you're not actually feeling the intensity of what it really feels like to be in that situation. That's self-protection, right? But it's also part of the cognitive dissonance. So listening to logic and remembering, okay, when I'm not feeling it, it's okay. I know it in my mind. I don't have to feel it to know it's true. Another thing is to talk to someone, talk to a support group, get yourself in SPAN or another group that is supportive and caring. Talk to a coach or a therapist. Talk to, I, I never suggest friends only because for this particular matter, a lot of friends don't get it and it can cause a lot of hurt when your friend doesn't get what you've been through. And when it seems like they're telling you just get over it or whatever they tell you, well, you're better off without them, you know, and that doesn't really help in the situation because what we need is validation. We need validation that this whole experience lines up with something that is toxic, regardless of what we call the toxicity, right? We need, we need the validation from other people sometimes. So talk that when we have been in toxic relationships, and I will say this probably on every stream I do,
<laughs> because I think it's one of the more important points that actually keeps you safe and gets you healing. And that is that we need to build our self-worth. When we are denying our truth through cognitive dissonance and the abuse amnesia, I mean, we really are denying what happened to ourselves. So a part of us knows that that isn't healthy. A part of us knows is part of us is screaming, would you listen to me? Come on, what's the matter with you? Listen to me. And another part of us is saying, oh, it's okay. You know, and it can be really, a lot of people feel um, shame or guilt or like their self-worth drops because they're not taking care of themselves in the situation because they're, they're going back or they're allowing it to continue or whatever they're doing. They're not actually allowing it, but you know what I'm saying? That's how they feel. So as you build your self-worth, your understanding of of this can can change. And also as you build your self-worth, your tolerance for any abuse goes down. And that's what you want. You want your tolerance to go down and your standards to raise at the same time. And you raise your standards through experiencing yourself as being worth having standards for. So other ways to help with breaking cognitive dissonance are talking about it, talk about your experience, talk about what you're feeling like we do here. If you need it, um, if you need it to talk about it, go to a therapist. If you need to talk about it, come to coaching that is what we do. We talk about this stuff and you get to talk about it and talk about it and talk about it as much as you need to in order to work your way through it with someone that gets it with someone that's been there and someone that experiences it in their own life and has worked their way through it and might have some ideas for you personally on how to, uh, in ways in which you're blocking your own, at least that's how I work, ways in which you're blocking your own uh, success. Support groups talking about the cognitive dissonance and, and, and getting ideas for what has helped other people. But it truly is about believing what is real, what is right in front of you, what is being shown to you and what you actually know versus what you feel like you want and need from that other person, right? It's breaking that, severing that so that you can get what you want and need in a healthy way. You will never get what you need from a narcissist. You are guaranteed an unhappy relationship. If you don't have a toxic person in your life, you have a 50-50 chance of finding a healthy relationship, right? If you're with one, you have a 100% chance of being in a miserable relationship. So there is that fact too. A ref what the narcissist is treating you like is not a reflection of who you are and what you're worth. You're worth an amazing amount, okay? And understanding that you are um, a person of value and worthy of love and being treated well. It's a lot of self-care and it can take time to get there. So just be patient with yourself. Keep working on it. Just keep, keep your mind open to a freedom that is out there, <laughs> okay?